Welcome back, everybody. In today's lecture, we're going to be continuing our discussion of vision. But in this one, what we're going to be doing is turning our attention away from the process of sensation. As a reminder, that's how we were able to convert those energies in the environment, in the case of vision, electromagnetic energy, into some type of neural signal. And we're going to now turn our attention away from that to perception, how we're able to decode that information that's coming in and be able to make sense of it mentally. To understand perception and how it works, I want you to just take a quick second and look at this image, trying to get the, the gist of it from just this little brief pause. That might have been a little too brief for some of you, but I'm guessing the vast majority of you, if you were paying attention to the screen when that image popped up, got a pretty coherent picture of everything that you were looking at. You probably all saw a number of individuals fishing, you probably saw a river, you probably saw lots of different individuals running around doing different activities, and you probably would even be able to list off a couple of the animals that you saw in that quick image that you were able to perceive. My question, of course, is how were you able to do that? You know, how were you able to take all of those stimuli that were hitting the back of your eyes and make a very coherent picture out of it in such a short period of time. Well, that's what we're doing when we're perceiving the information around us. We're able to decode all of the stimuli that are out there into something that makes some type of sense to us. And this ability to do something as easily as we do it is something that was really interesting to early psychologists why in the late 1800s when many people started trying to understand the mind this was one of the first places they stopped when they started looking at this topic we started going into a really interesting debate this debate revolved around the fact that we had lots of different components of what we were perceiving when we were looking at the world around us we didn't quite understand how our mind was able to do what it did Eventually, it led to people getting into it was really one of two camps, individuals that focused their attention on what was called the constructivist approach to perception and others that focused their attention on what was called the ecological approach. Nowadays, we sort of differentiate this between what we call top down and bottom up processing. Those studying the constructivist approach looked at how our expectations, our memories, and of preconceived components to our mind, we're shifting the information that we were taking in and trying to decode. Those studying the ecological approach focused their attention on what we were able to deduce from the elements of the information around us and how we were able to combine that in some way to make sense of something that we weren't actually manipulating in any way. Now, in the early years of psychology, there was a penchant for many individuals to not only study perception from one of these two camps, but to argue that their approach to studying perception was better than the approach of others. Nowadays, we tend to talk about the merger between these two and how most of these components are probably required in all of our perceptual abilities that we have. But just so we can understand why there was this debate and how people tried to attack this from different angles, I thought we would visit the topic of vision again and first focus our attention on one component to visual perception. It's something related to what we were talking about in the last class, our perception of colors. And we already talked about how essentially we had cells in the back of our eyes sending a message to our brain to help us figure out colors. How does the brain break down that information? Well, for a long period of time, all we had at our disposal were different theories and sort of proof that these theories had a lot of merit to them. And if we're looking for one of the original theories for how we were able to perceive color, we actually have to go back over 100 years ago, almost 150 years ago, to a pair of researchers named Young and Helmholtz, who presented in the infancy stages of psychology this thing that we call the Young-Helmholtz trichromatic theory of color vision. Their argument was that our brain might simply be perceiving color by just doing basic math. We, in this theory, 
had three different types of cells in our eyes that were creating different messages that ranged in how strong or robust they were based on how easily they were activated by the colors of what was present in the environment. The example would be if we had, say, cells that were detecting what we call short wavelength light, the ones that, again, were very compact and connected to each other. Even before we knew about cones, we understood the properties of light through lots of physics studies that had been done in the past where we could bend light in different ways and talk about the distances between these light fragments, even if we didn't necessarily have all of the things we needed to have a firm grasp on how light worked. So there was this thought that maybe we had cells that were receptive to this short wavelength light. We maybe had cells that were receptive to what we would call medium wavelength light. Obviously, this is kind of arbitrary because, again, if you look at the visual light spectrum, it goes well beyond what the eye can pick up on. But you know, somewhere in the middle of what the eyes could see, maybe we had cells that were receptive to that. And then lastly, they said maybe we have cells that are receptive to what we would call long wavelength light, the ones that were coming at a slightly slower frequency. In essence, the distance between the wavelengths was longer. And their argument was that our math could just do quick math, or sorry, our brain could just do quick math, where we'd have this grid in the back of our brains that was sensitive to certain visual areas of what we were seeing. And if, say, there was green present or blue present, the, the cells, the short wavelength cells and medium wavelength cells and red wavelength cells would respond in some pattern that the brain could pick up on. So if we were staring at green, well, our medium wavelength cells would be going nuts, while our short wavelength cells and red wavelength cells would be relatively dormant. As we creeped towards the blues, well, we would suddenly see a shift. And in fact, if we got to the violets, our short wavelength cells might be the only cells active, while the medium wavelength cells were just whimpering, making a small amount of noise, and our long wavelength cells would be completely silent. This idea not only made a lot of intuitive sense, but there was... A lot of evidence already at our disposal, even before we could dissect the eyes, to suggest that there was a lot of merit behind this trichromatic theory. One of the most commonly cited references for where we saw proof of our ability to, to kind of see color through these three types of cells was in people that actually didn't have the ability to see color in the same way as others. We often called these issues color deficiencies or sometimes color blindness, depending upon how severe or extreme people's inability to differentiate between colors actually was. For people who are actually color blind, they do not have the ability to see certain colors on the color spectrum the same way others do, what they see is a normal light spectrum that's represented in one of three different ways. We're actually not necessarily represented in one of three different ways, but they can't differentiate between one spectrum that everybody else can differentiate between and, and what's the, the normal light spectrum that all of us see. The three types of color blindnesses that exist are depicted there on the right. So for somebody struggling with deuteranopia, they cannot differentiate between the normal line on the top and the line on the bottom somebody struggling with protonopia, the two lines in the middle look identical, and somebody struggling with tridonopia cannot differentiate between the two lines in the bottom. Now the fact that these three types of color blindness exist, and we haven't found any other ones out there, well, I guess that's not entirely true, there's also something called monochromatism, where people can't really differentiate between any of the different frequencies out there. Um, but outside of that, the fact that we have these three issues, these three types of color blindness, really screams that there probably is some merit to this trichromatic theory. And in fact, people often cited it as proof for the existence of the trichromatic theory long before we knew anything about cones. We also do see individuals who struggle with what we call color insensitivity. So some of you might recognize that you can't see all colors perfectly usually, but you don't necessarily see the top and bottom lines in any of these three pairings looking identical. Well, you might have what we call a color insensitivity, and these are actually much more common, where essentially our brain can't decode everything perfectly due to something usually genetic, sometimes biological, but usually genetic, 
that causes the cone communication with the brain to be slightly less effective than it should be. Usually we need cues or something to help us with these color insensitivities if that's what we're struggling with. And the fact that they come in the number of forms that they come in tells us a little bit more about genetics, but it again, gave us really good evidence for this trichromatic theory. And if we look at our history of this kind of field developing, we were able to provide really concrete evidence for the trichromatic theory after we were able to detect that we do actually seem to have three types of cones, our short wavelength cones, medium wavelength cones, and long wavelength cones. All of these findings give a lot of credibility to this ecological view or bottom-up processing view of color vision. And it was kind of considered by many to be a huge win for people using the ecological approach to understand visual perception. And then we ran into a bit of a problem. After people had celebrated the trichromatic theory as the clear explanation for how we saw color, people started running into issues that couldn't be explained through this trichromatic theory. One of the big problems that pops up is the fact that when we're trying to determine color, the amount of light in the environment can have a pretty big impact on what colors we're perceiving. We're going to talk about this issue of light and dark contrasts and how exposure to these things can have these after effects that, that last us for a long time a little bit later. But the other problem that I want to talk about is one that was really hailed as this amazing discovery by perceptual psychologists and it was actually grasped at by a very famous artist named Jasper Johns. This effect is something called the afterimage effect. I'm going to actually recreate it here in this class. For us to do it, what I need you to do is just stare at that flag that you see pictured here for almost a minute. And while you're staring at it, you are allowed to blink, but for this effect to work, you can't move your head, you can't close your eyes for an extended period of time, you can't have anything jolt in your eyes from spot to spot. You have to just simply stare at that flag in pretty much the same spot in your visual field. If you're doing that while I'm talking, what you'll start to do is send this large number of messages from your eyes to your brain. And this message essentially is your cells screaming to the brain, Things like, I see yellow, I see yellow in this spot, and I see green. Don't move your eyes right now. Just keep them on there. And your eyes are screaming again. I see yellow, I see green in certain spots, I see black in certain spots. And your brain is sort of getting bombarded with this message. And one would think that if that message, that bombardment stopped, well, then we would just eventually conclude that we're not seeing those colors anymore. Is there more to the story? Is there more to this message than just, I see yellow, or I see green, or I see black? Well, appreciate what happens when we take these things away. Let's do it. My guess is, for the percentage of you that were able to stay focused, I honestly have no idea where we're at right now with that, but I'm guessing a decent number of you were able to stay focused on that flag. I'm guessing many of you are a little tripped out if you've never seen this before because you're probably staring at a red, white, and blue flag on this blank screen in front of you. This is a pretty robust effect and it lasts for a pretty long period of time. It's what we call the afterimage effect and it cannot be explained through the trichromatic theory. It's simply not a component to this idea. And it led a lot of perceptual psychologists to either go back to the drawing board on how we perceive color or find kind of an extra tidbit that could explain this weird after image effect. Eventually, it led to many scientists describing this particular experience as evidence for something we call the opponent process theory. It's this notion that Maybe we do have three types of cones that are receptive to certain colors, but we might also have cones, or not cones, but cells linked to these cones that are receptive to other bits of information relating to color. There was this idea that we might have cells that are not only sending the message of I see blue and I see green and I see red and I see all these colors, but maybe they're also sending a message that talks about contrasts. 
when you say I see green you're not just saying I see green according to this opponent process theory you're actually saying I see green not red I see green not red you're not just seeing blue you're seeing a lack of yellow at the same time so you're seeing blue not yellow blue not yellow your brain is getting this kind of combined message that allows you to see what's there but also allows you to differentiate between colors a little bit better and, and get a sense of what's not there it works great for most of our color perception and we want us to recognize that right now that the after image effect is not a common issue for most of us it's only in these rare situations where it pops up but if we do fatigue the cells enough we send a message to the brain enough to where things start to get exhausted or the brain just starts to sort of recalibrate itself to adjust for what's going on when we take those images away the brain starts to misperceive things for a short period of time much like with the trichromatic theory we discovered this effect before we could actually find evidence for it on the cellular level but eventually we were able to trace this opponent process theory back to the cells within the eye in particular the cells that connected to the rods and cones find in our eyes called bipolar cells and ganglion cells most neuroscientists are convinced that there's a combination of effects between these two cells that are picking up information from our cones that creates this sort of secondary message that's being sent to the brain where our cones do seem to be responsive to three different types of light and those three different messages that are getting sent to the brain have this added bit that comes from the bipolar cells and ganglion cells so we get theoretically a slightly more accurate more coherent impression in the brain of what it is that's present in terms of the frequency of the light in our environment and again this works really well most of the time it's just if we create the right scenario we can find odd effects like the after image effect to show that it's not fail proof every single time and if we're going back to that early debate about the ecological versus constructivist view what i want us to get from this is this seems to even though it's more complex still provide more evidence that maybe perception of color is just a byproduct of the signals getting to our brain another example of what we would again call the ecological approach to perception and i'm guessing you're also very familiar with the idea that there's probably more to this story there's more complexity out there and this is what we're going to be getting to next how sometimes when we're perceiving things making sense of them either the the movement of something or the elements of something that we're seeing we do have the potential to sometimes miss stuff this might have happened in that first image that we looked at earlier i'm guessing many of you because i paused a little longer than i should have caught a few odd things like maybe you saw that a sign was misplaced behind trees in the distance and that made no sense or that there was a gentleman in the middle of the picture shooting a gun right into a bridge which sort of looks like there's a boat that's going up it and you might have caught the oddness of the length of the fishing pole of the person right in front or the fact that the sizes of the animals make no sense or the church is going into the water for some inexplicable reason and all these things maybe didn't catch your eye right off the bat but if you look at them a little bit more closely you can appreciate how odd this picture is this leads us to ask are we doing this all the time are we not getting the whole picture because we've got other things impacting what it is we perceive and could that also relate to color vision to understand how we can relate this constructivist approach to color vision i want to highlight a really interesting effect that we've discovered over the years it's this idea of something that we call color constancy where when we look at the color of say somebody's shirt while they're in a room with us if the ambient light in that room changes maybe we switch from a blue light to a red light or even a white light to a yellow light even though that the signal bouncing off of that shirt that we're looking at is going to change it will change a little bit in frequency because of what's being absorbed and what's not now with the new light that's being presented we don't think of that light 
that's hitting our eyes is being an indicator that that shirt or that thing that we're looking at has changed in color. We are doing this all the time as we get into different environments and recognize that there's different electromagnetic light sources out there that make things look slightly different from situation to situation. And we think when we're looking at things that we have a pretty good grasp of what's truly green when we're looking at something even with kind of things that don't make it truly green because of the environment that's in it. This is what we call color constancy. So again, much like we saw with the after image effect, uh, something that produces weird consequences, but for the most part is very advantageous to have. But there are things that throw us off because of how much we rely on color constancy. An example of how much we can be thrown off with this effect is highlighted in the image to the right. Now, most of you, when you see this image, automatically infer that obviously A and D are the same and B and C are the same color. But in reality, there's only one pair of colors in this image out of those four that are identical, and that's actually B and D. And I know I'm telling you this and you don't believe me, and that's because your brain is really, really stubborn when it comes to this effect of color constancy. It's really, really stubborn in reality overall when it comes to what colors we're perceiving. And it relates to something that we call the retinex theory of color vision. That essentially our eyes are sending very specific messages to the brain. And the brain is decoding that set of messages to help us get a sense of what colors we're looking at. But that's not where we stop. The retinex theory says that we place expectations as a result of the environment, the ambient light, past experiences, on our kind of processing of the visual information that's hitting our brain so we can get usually a more accurate interpretation of what we're seeing, but one that can be thrown off in situations like this. I know there's still some doubters out there that B and D are the same, so let me squash that by showing you here. These really are the exact same color. B and D might look different, but if you connect the dots, they're the same. And I promise I wasn't messing with the tint of these to connect them. I know some of you still think that's the case, and I wasn't. It, it just is what it is, and there's nothing extra to it. It's just our brain almost refuses to see it, even with this evidence in front of us. Most of the time when we're talking about this color constancy effect, we're usually referencing it in our attempts to understand how shadows and how changes in overall lighting can impact our perception of color. One of the, the more often cited examples of color constancy is actually this checkerboard with a cylinder on top of it that you see pictured in front of us. What researchers often ask people is which checkerboard piece is darker overall if you were going to get, say, a paint splotch and put it on the, the different checkerboard pieces there. The one pictured on the top with a circle on it, or the one pictured in the middle, kind of under the shadow of that cylinder, that circle. Now I know many of us are recognizing right now that you're sitting in a psych class and you're probably being thrown for a little bit of a loop here and you should adjust, but nonetheless, your brain is so stubborn when it comes to this color constancy effect it's almost impossible to believe that this is anything other than a straightforward question. Most of us probably assume that even though they're probably somewhat close, the checkerboard tile on the top is obviously darker than the one in the middle. In reality, they are exactly the same. There's no difference in their color. And just to appreciate how stubborn our brain is on this, let's take it away. I'm guessing you see now the one on the top again is slightly darker than the one on the bottom, even though you just learned that they're the exact same hue. They are really, really the same, right? This effect is very robust and it shows, even for something as simple as color vision, how important our memory, how important our intentions and, and, and other cognitions are when it comes to processing what it is we're actually perceiving. And this is something that we find not only for color vision, for pretty, but for pretty much every perceptual thing that we engage in when it comes to not only visual perception, but also touch, and taste, and smell, and hearing. 
And it actually led to the development of a movement within perceptual psychology research called the Gestaltist movement. Now, this Gestaltist approach has actually bled into other branches of psychology that go beyond cognitive psychology and, and perceptual psychology. It's bled into things like clinical psychology and personality psychology. So you might hear this name mentioned in a couple different areas. But when it comes to perceptual psychology and how this Gestaltist approach works, understand that people who used Gestalt psychology ideas to understand perception focus their attention on how our interpretations, our expectations, how different kind of tricks of the mind do shift what it is that we're perceiving. A classic uh, statement that you'll hear many Gestalt psychologists make when studying how perception work is the whole is greater than the sum of all of its parts. Essentially, it means that with what we have, we tend to do more with it. We tend to place expectations and other elements that are going on in our mind on the processing of information. And in doing so, we tend to actually create a much more elaborate picture in our minds than what's actually there. Usually it's a beneficial thing. Usually this particular approach to processing stuff, again, just like the other stuff we've talked about, has more advantages than disadvantages, but it does result in some rather quirky things. For example, if you look at the two words in the upper right hand corner of this slide, I'm guessing that all of you inevitably when you saw them automatically read the cat. But in reality, that's almost certainly not the cat. It could be the ched, but the cat is not possibly correct because that H and A are identical. Could, I guess, technically also be take hot if you wanted to fill in that gap, but that's you doing even more with the information there. And it again highlights how we take something that's fairly simple and make a little bit more of it when we are using our mind. The Gestaltists in the early 1900s started not only discovering these things and using them as proof that our mind was really important, but they also used them to develop sets of laws and principles it could help give us an understanding of some of the techniques that all of us are using in our perceptual world. And there were numerous visual laws and perceptual, uh, I guess, principles that were developed over the years. And we can cover just a few of them in this class just to understand how we understood perception better once Gestaltists started to tackle this concept. You see to the right underneath the phrase that, well, you can interpret it however you want, four of the different laws of perception that we discovered. First is called the law of proximity. It's this law that dictates that when we're perceiving things, we tend to cluster things that are closer together into groups. So you don't see six random lines. Usually you see three pairs of lines in front of you, or you could even maybe see three rows, rows if they're uh, sorry, three columns, I guess we would call them, if, if our brain is so inclined to actually pair those two lines that are closely to, closer to each other in those three different pairings. The next law that you see represented on the right is the law of similarity, where again, we don't see nine discrete shapes. We see three columns of shapes, a column of triangles, a column of circles, and then another column of triangles. Law of continuity suggests that we don't see a squiggly line traversing a straight line. We instead see some type of mogul that's kind of going up. I'm going to correct myself there. But we do actually see a squiggly line traversing a straight line. We don't see a collection of moguls on the top and bottom and top and bottom. If you teach this class enough, I guess you start to see it differently. But uh, most of us would follow the law of continuity and see that line that's traversing the other line, not the other way around. Another law we have is something called the law of connectedness, where we are inclined to see because things are touching each other, it's three different barbells in the lower right hand corner, not six dots and three lines that have some type of connection between each other. There's lots of other laws that are out there and they all give us a little tidbits of information about how perception works. But I want to go beyond just understanding how these laws kind of work to 
really appreciating what it allows us to do. Because what these laws allow us to do is take something that's relatively random, something that's very incomplete, and through our mind's power and some of the tricks we do, we can eventually transform something that originally looks incomplete into something that looks fairly clear. I'm guessing about half the class right now, looking at this image, immediately recognized what this image was of, even though there's lots of things missing. But I'm also guessing there is another half of the class that's staring at this thinking, what is this random combination of things? Is this something like an inkblot test that we'll talk about later? Or is this just some error in uploading? It's not. I promise there is something behind that image. And if you start connecting the dots long enough, you will eventually be able to see what's pictured there. For those of you struggling, or those of you a little unsure about whether or not you see what's supposed to be there, I can give a couple hints. The first hint is that this thing is an animal. And this animal is looking pretty much directly at the camera. From that, I'm guessing some of you might have been able to pick up on what that is. But others have no idea of what I'm talking about. Well, this is where things are going to get a little bit more challenging if you still don't know what it is I'm looking at. Because usually in class I can point to the screen and walk our way down things and everybody can start to connect the dots pretty quickly. But obviously now we really can't do that. So I want to direct your attention to the kind of dark, circular looking thing, not necessarily in the far upper left hand corner, but just a little bit down from the upper left hand corner. The biggest sort of circular looking object almost looks like the, the shape of a pair of sunglasses, well not a pair of sunglasses, but one half of a sunglass uh, on the left hand side. I want you to recognize that that sort of sunglass looking shape sort of transitions over to a sort of circular shape right underneath it to the right. Now, those are two elements to this animal that's looking at you. The first thing, the sunglass looking thing, is an ear. The thing that it's connecting to is an eye. And to the right of that eye is the bridge of a nose that slowly works its way down to the bottom of the screen where you see two nostrils and a mouth. This, if you haven't caught it yet, is an image of a cow. And the ability to see this is all about perception. If you can't see the cow, I promise, if you pause it, you'll eventually be able to see it. Um, but we are gonna move on now that I've given you pretty much as much as I can but before we do that, I do want us to appreciate, once we see it, how much else we see. Most of us can see the fence in the background, some sort of image of a field back there as well. And the cow is pretty darn crystal clear. But before you saw it, before you filled in those blanks, it probably just seemed like a random collection of black and white splotches all over a sheet of paper. This is the power of our perceptual intuition, we could call it. Once expectations are placed on things, it gives us a whole or, or better, I guess, image of what's around. It just does cause sometimes some not so desirable consequences where we miss certain things or our mind gets really messed with when we start trying to use some of the principles and laws that usually help in situations where they're not advantageous. One of the, the classic places where this is a problem is when we try to convert three-dimensional objects or three-dimensional images into two dimensions. The, this can actually be seen in the picture on the left-hand corner where this two-dimensional picture in our minds is represented in three dimensions. And it makes us think that there should be nice symmetry and, and logic in those logs that you see pictured between the two men. But if you look at the angle on the left, 
you'll be led to conclude that there's actually four logs that you're looking at. Well, the one on the right suggests you're looking at three. It's almost impossible for us to catch where those differences are coming from unless you really break it down. Because our mind is just not designed with the way it's structured to be able to pick up on those subtle things that make that picture possible. It also can get us to completely ignore stuff and, and really struggle to catch things like the image to the right of that first one where most of you are probably seeing either a young woman sort of looking away from the camera or an old woman looking down sort of toward the camera but more to, to the left of the camera. And once you see one of these two, unless you've been exposed to this before, it's really tough to see the other person. There are two faces, though, in this picture. They're, they're not two faces within the same picture. You have to change your perception of it. But you can see this as one of two things based on what you're focusing on. Just like the image of the cow, I'm not going to pause too long and let everybody try to figure out what they're seeing, because I am convinced some of you can see both already. But I want us to appreciate how important what we saw first was in our perception of that second image. Another classic example of how our perception of things can slightly tweak just based on subtle differences is the classic cube that many of you have probably drawn or seen in any of your math classes. I want us to look at this cube a second time though, well, probably for a millionth time for some of us. I want us to notice that many of us when we look at this cube initially see the cube as either pointing down and toward us or up and toward us. But if you look at it long enough, shift your eyes just a bit, maybe get a little blurry and come back, what you'll notice is that cube can move. And once you see it in one direction, it's really tough to see it the other way. And once it gets switched, it's tough to see the reverse again. It's the amazingness of how perception works and how stubborn our mind can be sometimes. And how, again, sometimes we can miss stuff based on certain elements to what we're perceiving. There's actually researchers that have explored these ideas of things like floor and ground and shadowing to understand what our minds are drawn to when we see something. And we can create kind of weird effects through this, like the effect that you see on the vase to the right, where what you see originally when you look at this is probably just a weird misshapen vase that you think maybe somebody isn't doing too well in their ceramics class on. But if you look at the reflection of that vase, if you look at its shadow to the right, you might see something that you didn't catch the first time. You might see the profiles of two faces. This was actually something that was done for the king and queen of England many times over in our history, where they would have somebody actually put the faces, the profiles of the king and queen in England in these vases, and you wouldn't be able to see them unless you saw the shadow of it. Now, all these effects that we're looking at here led to this huge movement in the early years of perceptual psychology research to where we not only wanted to understand how the mind was able to process the visual information in front of us, but they also wanted to understand how we could trick the mind, how we could create these things called visual illusions that, that not only showed how the mind had some faults to it, but also potentially gave us some insights as to how the mind was doing what it was doing in the first place. A classic example of these optical illusions that we talked about is one depicted here called the Mueller liar illusion. In this illusion, people are asked to estimate which of the two vertical lines you see in front of you are the longest. The one on the left with the lines connecting to it sort of pointing toward each other, or the one on the right with the lines connecting to it pointing apart. And I'm guessing most of you have already realized because you're sitting here and I've shown you lots of tricks of the mind and we're even saying we're going to be looking at tricks of the mind, that these lines are identical in length. They are indeed identical in length, but I'm guessing there's this voice in the back of your head that's also screaming, that can't be entirely true though. I mean, the one on the left is 
probably a little bit shorter than the one on the right. And I promise you, if we remove those lines going in and out, you'll quickly see that they are identical to each other. Another classic example of an illusion that, that we looked at to get a better insight as to how the mind worked is something called the Ponzo illusion. This gave us a sense of the importance of vanishing points, both in drawings and our perceptions of distance. The first Ponzo illusion we ever created, well, it was created by a gentleman named Ponzo, is the one depicted on the right, where you see two horizontal lines that are kind of straddled by two lines that are coming together at what sort of looks like a vanishing point. People in this activity are asked which line is longer, the horizontal line on the top or the one on the bottom. And most people, when they perceive this illusion, thought of the top one as just a slight bit longer than the one on the bottom. My favorite example of kind of a revamped version of the Ponzo illusion is the image that you see to your left. When people are asked, which of the kind of bolded lines are longer, the one on the left or the one on the right? Now I'm guessing many of you, when you see this revamped version of the Ponzo illusion, are convinced that this must be a mistake in the slides, that the one on the left is obviously, in this case, because of all the information present, just slightly smaller than the one on the right. But if you take your finger or pencil or whatever and measure the distance of those lines, you will see that those two vertical lines, the ones that are bolded, are the exact same size. It really shows how stubborn our mind can be and how much we can learn from illusions like this. If we want to see kind of the culmination of years of work, looking at how we see size and depth and how we integrate all these things to understand distances and colors, my favorite examples of this is something that we can actually see in the Bay Area. It's something called the Ames Room, and it can be found at the Exploratorium. If you've got a chance, I would always encourage you to, to kind of look into going to the Exploratorium, simply because they have a lot of really fun stuff there. But within that area is this Ames Room, which is really mind-bending. As you see here in this image, it gives you this perception that you're looking at a square room, but it's nothing like it. The two children in this image are the exact same size, but our brain can't see it. Our brain is tricked into thinking the person on the right is significantly larger because of the way that this very distorted, awkwardly put together room is situated in a way that makes it look like a nice, normal rectangular room with a back that's actually much further, further away and much further down than the front, the right-hand side. If you don't believe me, I would encourage you to look for a YouTube video on the Ames Room just to highlight how amazingly robust this effect can be. Now, we're getting close to the end here, but I do want to revisit something that we talked about earlier. This pseudo debate, more different perceptions on how we should study perception. And that's the, the difference between what we call the constructivist versus the ecological view. As we mentioned, people studying the constructivist view argued that a lot of our perception is a byproduct of our mind working on the information coming to it. It's adjusting things, it's making sense of stuff, and in doing so, it's distorting what it is we're taking in. This again is linked to something we nowadays call top-down processing. The ecological view argues that our perception might be primarily based on what's at hand and simply the messages coming from our sensory organs that reach the brain. It's not that the ecological view is wrong. We want us to understand that. It's that kind of both things, the ecological or what we call bottom-up processing, and the constructivist, what we call top-down processing, are both playing pivotal roles in our ability to perceive what's around us. The fact that these things exist, they, they work the way they do, highlights how much we need to understand cognition if we want to understand how the mind works. We're going to take this idea with us as we progress and start exploring other areas of cognition in the next couple of classes.